three stars, maybe a hundred or a few hundred solar mass and galaxies get going. We just don't know. We know that something burns that off. Oh, which actually, I'm sorry, there's a piece I skipped, which is kind of important. So these things sort of are releasing you, these early galaxies or quasars, whatever it is, releases UV photons, X-ray photons. Will those go and hit the neutral hydrogen gas? That's why they're being absorbed. But when it does, it kicks the electron off. Reionization. But the important thing that's happened between here is the universe has gotten so big, so thin, that when an electron is kicked off, it takes it a very long time to find any proton to hook back onto. It would if it could find one. So it takes a very little bit of UV light now to then ionize all of the hydrogen. So you go through this period here, which is called the epoch of reionization, because here they combine. Here you are now reionizing. And after this point, the universe becomes very, very uh, ionized and thus highly transparent. This is what we are seeing with the Hubble Space Telescope. I have Sorry, I should have. Yeah. You said the neutral hydrogen glows in the radio. So the neutral hydrogen, that, as we see it now. Well, and so that's what we're going to try and go see. We know neutral hydrogen glows. We make radio maps of that. What happens, actually, for those of you who are in that lowest um, electron state, where it's sitting there in the lowest electron state, it can the electron and the proton have spin. They act like little magnets. And they can either be aligned or anti-aligned. And that gives you two very slightly different uh, energy states. And provides a line at 21 centimeters. And this is actually a huge amount of work is done at 21 centimeters, 1.4 gigahertz. So something like a very large array makes a lot of its work <coughs> at that thing. That's how the center of our galaxy was found, because there's neutral hydrogen in our galaxy. And it's in our galaxy, you have the center, it's going away from you on one side and towards you on the other. You can see that Doppler shift. You can see where it's sitting at right at 1.4 gigahertz, and that's the center of the galaxy. That's how we found it. So, one, yeah. one quick question. You, you, you say galaxy. When you say galaxies by definition, you imply stars. Stars make up galaxies. Oh, yeah. Either that or we need a new term for a clump of gas that is not, doesn't have stars. Yes. And, and I've been a galaxy because what we know is Andromeda, yes. our own galaxy, has stars. Yeah. So we need a third term. Yeah, you're probably right. For the most part, I'm going to soft pedal this because <laughs> for two reasons. One, I don't have another term. <laughs> uh, but the other thing is it's believed that stars form very quickly. Right. Now, there are probably places still in our universe today which are just slightly over dense. There's a little bit of extra gas floating around, but it never got big enough to pull that gas together and to form a bunch of stars. But it never got dense, about never got dense enough. Never got dense enough. That's why you argue about the, the naming of the Big Bang, because I consider it a big puff. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, this is like, you know, all these uh, Kuiper Belt objects they're finding. Are they planets? Are they not planets? Uh, you know, it's at some it's level, it's a fight over words. Uh, it's important, but it's a religious argument. Let me know it. Pop out. <laughs> the dense gas, is that the same thing as the, the Bacopulus? Did I say it right? The B-O-K? I don't know. No, it's just dark. Oh! Dark matter. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, dark matter. Like? Bot. Gob Gobulus. Globular. Globular. Is that what that is? No, no it's just, uh, just called dark matter obscuring yes. background stars and stuff. That's oh, okay. 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 Yeah. That's not yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's so not even right. the spot where there's no optical. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, no, that's yeah, that's sort of and, and that's a different kind of your various dark matters. That's that's the dust. dust. Right. Yeah. Uh, so optically dark, but not what not what you're talking about. 
dark matter, which is yet another fun entertaining subject. But mm -hmm. I probably should avoid that. There's something there. The evidence, the evidence is unfortunate. It's one of those things that you wish it work in certain ways, but the evidence is getting really hard to get around. There's some, it's either that or we misunderstand gravity rather fundamental. Neither one of those answers make anybody feel warm and fuzzy. <laughs> um, so what are the pictures that we would see? So if we looked back, and this is a theorist's picture of what we would see. So where there is neutral hydrogen, you get this sort of when. So there's certain areas which are dense, which are these bright areas. There's lots of neutral hydrogen. There's certain areas which are less dense, and so they aren't as bright. And then there are these holes, and these are around the first galaxies and quasars. This is what is emitting UV light and turning a bubble of the hydrogen into ionized hydrogen as opposed to neutral hydrogen. Ionized hydrogen does not glow in the radio, so it appears as these great big holes in your map. And so what you can imagine doing is looking at this gas as it's coalescing together, grouping up, forming those first galaxies, which then start re-ionizing and blowing these strongman spheres, these bubbles, through the neutral hydrogen. And eventually these all combine and everything is gray. All right. The problem is this radial line is incredibly weak. It is five orders of magnitude dimmer than the other radio objects between us and it. Uh, it is very hard to see. And there have been sort of five ways that people have thought of trying to look at it. I'll sort of, um, the first way is to just sort of, uh, because it's at 21 centimeters when it starts, as a function of redshift, we're able to measure the redshift just by what frequency it appears at. If it appears at, um, instead of uh, 140, uh, 1400 megahertz, 1 1.4 gigahertz, it appears at 140 megahertz, that's a redshift of 10. So we can sit there and walk, actually not, but we can sit there and walk through it. So you might see a step, hard to do. Uh, you might be able to do statistics looking for those sizes of bubbles, even if you can't quite image them, which I'll talk about later. You might also be able to see holes. We know where some of the high redshift quasars are from the Sloan survey. You might in radio look at those and see a bubble around it where there is no emission surrounded by the I'll talk about that. You might also see absorption lines or actually be able to make a picture that these would take vastly larger radio telescopes, things like the square kilometer array, much future ones. So I'm going to talk about a couple of these ideas and some of the telescopes we're trying to build to go after this. So the first one is at the Very Large Array in New Mexico. And actually, how many people here have been to the Very Large Array? Oh, this is a long time. So anyway, uh, this is a, uh, we're looking for holes around these uh, couple of these highest redshift quasars. This requires, these are about a redshift of six and a half. So we have to build receivers at 195 <coughs> megahertz to go look for this. Unfortunately, 195 megahertz is right in commercial TV. <laughs> Channels 9, 10, a little bit 11. Uh, channel 10 in particular. Uh, and in